안녕하세요. Good evening and welcome. My name is Min Jung Kim, and I am the Barbara B. Taylor Director of the St. Louis Art Museum. And we are so pleased to be collaborating with the Gateway Korea Foundation to celebrate the Tan O Spring Festival with all of you here in the audience in the Farrell Auditorium. And with an audience participating virtually from Gongju National University, where it is Saturday morning. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you also to Janet Park for presenting her performance piece, Movement Within Stillness, this evening as we were gathering in the lobby and taking our seats here in the auditorium. Janet is a St. Louis based artist trained in classical ballet contemporary modern dance, and Korean traditional dance. She oversaw and participated in the Seoul International Dance Festival and the Digital Dance Festival in Korea as an international director. Over the last 20 years, Janet has moved away from performance at traditional dance venues to perform at such venues as museums, architecturally significant buildings, and world heritage sites. Her collaborative performances with painters, sculptors, or composers at museum spaces, galleries, or specific sites have premiered in Italy, France, England, and Finland. Since moving to St. Louis and joining the museum as the Barbara B. Taylor Director, Last September, I've enjoyed getting to know the museum's talented and dedicated staff and volunteers, as well as becoming acquainted with our global collections and diverse schedule of exhibitions and educational offerings, as well as learning about the many collaborations and partnerships with organizations and communities throughout the region. I was also pleased to learn of the museum's long-standing partnership with the Gateway Korea Foundation, which over its many years has included the co-creation of public programs celebrating Korean arts and culture through offerings for adults and family audiences. GKF's commitment to inspiring cross-cultural appreciation and understanding in connection with Korean arts and cultural experience is admirable and impactful and aligns with the museum's own mission to collect, present, interpret, and to conserve works of art to the highest quality across time and cultures, to educate, inspire discovery, and elevate the human spirit, to preserve a legacy of artistic achievement for the people of St. Louis and the world, and to engage, include, and represent the full diversity of the St. Louis community supporting it. This is, of course, uh, including the rich artistic traditions and innovations of Korea. And I encourage everyone to visit Gallery 227 to view the selection of Korean artworks drawn from the museum's permanent collection. The museum is grateful to the entire Gateway Korea Foundation Board of Directors for their partnership and their support over the many years and everything that they have done to make tonight's program possible. Special thanks in particular to Young Hee Nam Krom, Gateway Korea Foundation founding chair and Tan Oh committee chairperson, and Dr. Sung Gwon Yu, chair of the GKF Board of Directors. It is now my great pleasure to invite Young Hee Krum to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Young Hee. As the chair of the Dano Committee for Gateway Korea Foundation, I thank everyone being here to celebrate Dano with us. Uh, Korea is geographically as well as culturally a gateway to Asia and vice versa. Gateway Korea Foundation takes it very seriously, as uh, you can tell by its uh, mission statement. Many volunteers and uh, the board of directors of GKF worked numerous hours to make this event possible. 
I would appreciate if uh, you can stand up and uh, receive our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we also thank the Arts and the Education Council and the local community leaders for providing the grant to the Gateway Korea Foundation to support this celebration. We thank the St. Louis Art Museum uh, and the numerous museum staff. I really cannot name each of you in this short time we have now. It is really delightful to work with you all. Um, I know many of you just, uh, um, it makes me cry, the, all the support you all give us to get this thing done that come about. Um, Gateway Korea Foundation and the St. Louis Art Museum has been providing this festival for the past nine years. Um, this year is more special for us. It is to welcome to the St. Louis Korean American community, Min Jung Kim, the ba Barbara B. Taylor, director of St. Louis Art Museum. Please join us, a small token of our welcome. <laughs>
Wow, that was a great way to start. Greetings, good evening. My name is Amanda Thompson Rundall, and I'm the museum's director of learning and engagement. Before I introduce our next speaker, I would like to note one of the many things that I appreciate and enjoy about the museum's ongoing partnership with Gateway Korea Foundation is the creative spirit and innovative approaches to programming we've been able to pursue together over our many years of working together on educational programs and community engagement initiatives. Tonight's program, as I think you've already begun to see and will continue, definitely showcases this through its use of technology and exploration of themes and topics to foster, foster global interconnectedness and cross-cultural exchange. We have audience members and presenters here in person at the St. Louis Art Museum and audience members and presenters more than 6,500 miles away in Korea. It is my pleasure next to introduce Maya Stiller, Associate Professor of Korean Art History and Visual Culture at the University of Kansas. Maya earned a BA and MA with double majors in Korean Studies and Art History from Humboldt University, a doctorate in East Asian Art History from Freie Universität Berlin, and a PhD in Asian Languages and Cultures from UCLA. Her most recent articles have been published in the Journal of Asian Studies and the Journal of Korean Religions. Her book, Carving Status at Kum Gansan, was recently published by University of Washington Press. She's currently working on her second book project, Korean Buddhist Temple Economy, which highlights several strategies, including fundraising and manufacturing, that Korean temples used to become economically self-sufficient. Maya is joining us tonight via Zoom from South Korea, where she is this summer conducting research. She's deliver to deliver her presentation for us this evening that answers the question, how Korean is K-pop? Please join me in giving Maya Stiller a warm welcome. So how Korean is K-pop? In the next um, 25, 30 minutes or so, I will give you um, perhaps a more like scholarly or academic perspective on, on K-pop. And what I will first do is to get us all started. <laughs> I will play you a couple of seconds from Psy's That That. Some of you may have already watched it on YouTube. It was launched, I think, um, maybe a month ago, and it has already garnered 217 million and more views. So just as a prelude to my to my talk, let's let's listen in, okay? And it's featuring Suga of BTS. So for all the BTS fans among you, um, you will see a Suga. Can you feel it? Whoa, yeah. Whoa, whoa. Can you feel it? Can you feel it? Whoa, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she goes. Okay, so this video basically already shows us many, many distinct features of K-pop, and I will explain many of those in, in the forthcoming minutes. Now, what I will be doing um, is, is basically a lecture composed of three sections or segments, okay? So I will first talk about how we can define K-pop, and then talk a little bit about the historical context, and finally, I will talk about traditional elements and, and confusion values that are supposedly related to, to the K-pop industry. Okay. And throughout these segments, I will show you music videos. And I know that there are many uh, K-pop fans in the audience, right? And I, I know that you enjoy listening to the music and enjoy the dance moves and the songs. But what we're going to do in the next couple of minutes is take a more like scholarly approach or academic approach to K-pop, okay? 
And, and I hope this will enrich your understanding of K-pop and where it's coming from. All right, so first segment, definition of K-pop. Now, K-pop is a capitalist mode of production. It is a style of training, um, producing and advertising and also performing popular music as, as it is currently perfected in South Korea. And many of you may already familiar, may be already familiar with the term idol. So K-pop singers are usually referred to as idols. And what they do is with K-pop, they present a new style of presentation and performance. And languages in K-pop used to be mostly Korean, but in the last, I would say, five years or so, it's been increasingly also in English. So we have a mix of languages, English and Korean. And K-pop is genre fluid and ocular centric. So what I mean by that is ocular, ocular centric is that, um, you know, the visual, the visuals are very, very important. So with all the music videos, the dance moves, um, the makeup, the fashion, all that is very, very important in K-pop. And it is genre fluid. So K-pop is not a genre. It is actually um, composed of many, many different genres. And we will be listening in to Girl Generation, I Got a Boy, Sonio Shide, and we, you will hear different components of like hip hop, pop rock, and EDM. EDM means um, electronic dance music. Okay, so that is another feature of K-pop that it actually has these these different um, genres even within us one song. Okay, so let's listen in. Hey yo, Gigi. Okay, so so did you see the different stages, right? There was a little bit of hip hop, then it moved to pop rock, and then lastly it was EDM. Okay, so this what this is what I mean with the different genres within within a song. This is the the second segment of my talk. Okay, on the right hand side you see a photograph of the first K-pop band in the history of K-pop, Sotteji and the Boys. 1995 was the first was the year when when their when the first song was released, uh, "Come Back Home," and K-pop has basically been around for more than 25 years. Prior to K-pop, there was of course popular music in South Korea, but it was mainly U.S. American music and Korean so-called trot music. And trot is this kind of dum 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 kind of four four backbeat. Um, music that is actually coming from Japanese uh, Japanese enka music okay so these were like the two main um types of music that were that were around and and Sotoji and the boys brought in hip hop dance visual elements in music videos and fashion so all these things that we define as k-pop today right and there were many um, things going on in South Korea at the time, um, socially, politically, culturally, that led to the emergence of K-pop. And let me explain to you what I mean by that. So under 1993, 
um, Korea actually did not, South Korea did not actually have a democratically elected president. The first one was elected in 93, it was Kim Yong sam Until then, popular culture was under government control. So lyrics were censored, for instance. And um, so that was on the political side. And then in the 1990s, we also have um, the, the more broader distribution of like color TVs in South Korea. We have a rising middle class that could afford buying cassette tape video, um, cassette tape recorders, CD recorders. We have the expression of norebang or karaoke in, in South Korea. So it was the establishment of democracy in 93. It was the ad advancement of technology with color TV. We have the creation of CDs. We have the Walkman. <laughs> and, and basically musicians were no longer tied to broadcast and, and they could instead produce a unique product without input from the government. That was a major change. And then another very important aspect is that the travel, the foreign travel ban was lifted. Believe it or not, until 1989, it was very difficult for South Koreans to travel abroad because it was very difficult to get a passport. And that changed. And um, at that point, many young people got a passport and they went to Europe, they went to the US and they studied film and media. And then um, they, they, you know, after a couple of years, they went back to South Korea and they brought all that that knowledge um, back and 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 gave that to the um, emerging music and film industry. So, one of these pioneers um, that really brought K-pop to into a, into a start was Suman Lee, Lee Suman, the founder and director of SM Entertainment. Um, you may have heard his name before. So he was actually a singer and entertainer in the eighties. And then in the 90s, you know, once he was able to get his own passport, he went to Cal State Northridge. He studied um, U.S. popular music and film and media studies. And then he returned to South Korea, founded his company, and he has been in the K-pop industry ever since. Really, really successful with um, H.O.T. Um, H.O.T. and Soteji and Du Bois were basically rivals in 95, 96. I vividly remember that because I was in Korea at that time. So I remember those two bands and going to concerts to both of, of, both of them. And then there was S.E.S., one of the first female K-pop bands um, launched in 1997. So, yeah, Suman Lee is basically the, the K-pop pioneer, so, so to speak, um, from the 90s until today. So let's listen, let's listen in to Sotiji and to boys. And what I want you to would keep in mind while listening to the song is that it has strong, their music has strong subcultural features. And it it instantly became a hit because it was a powerful expression to the discontent of young people within South Korea's very rigid and competitive educational system. It's basically a song about someone who um, uh, escapes home and just doesn't want to come back, but it's kind of the parent's voice that's saying, you know, you must come back home, right? Um, and so this song points out the status of teenagers as a social minority in Korea and that music could play a central role in their self-expression. Okay, so let's let's just listen in for a couple of seconds to, so you get an idea of the very first K-pop song. <laughs> Okay, yes, so for those of you who are familiar with 1990s US pop music, <laughs> may recall that there was a very, very famous song by Cypress Hill, Insane in the Membrane. If you don't know that song, definitely look it up on YouTube. The beats and the sounds are very, very similar, okay? Um, but what was new with um, the Sotoji and the Boys version of that song is, of course, the lyrics, and the choreography and the fashion. And, and that's what K-pop is so known for, right? The choreography and the fashion. And, you know, looking at this picture, um, I know you may not believe this, but they were actually fashion idols in the 90s. And I remember that, you know, those Oshkosh like pants and the hats were really, really fashionably, fashionable that, back then. And I remember buying a hat, a kind of Sotoji uh, kind of hat. And, you know, I, I remember those days. So, so that was the beginning. And then 
yeah, what happened in the late 1990s was that a big financial crisis in South Korea and other tiger states in, in East Asia and South Asia is called the IMF uh, crisis. And there was a there was there were major changes going on at that time in South Korea. So first of all, until 1997, the middle class goal in South Korean society had been get a job at a Jebol company. So Jebol means, I mean, you know, large conglomerates like Samsung or Hyundai. So that was the goal, right? But then because of the crisis, people realized, wait a second, a white collar job at a Jebol is actually not secure. <laughs> And um, working in the entertainment industry had not been very much like highly regarded by parents until then. But because of the crisis, I think um, parents became more like flexible and, and they allowed kids to actually um, become idle trainees and, you know, become more active in the, in the entertainment industry. And so what we see in the mid, like in the 90s is political change, technological development, a larger pool of trainees. So there was a little bit more competition, right, among trainees. And then all this expertise from people who had studied abroad was coming back into Korea. And so all that basically contributed to the emergence of Hallyu, which is the Korean word for like Korean wave, right? And that is a collective term for the international popularity of South Korean pop culture. And that includes film, that includes music. So K-pop is actually part of, of the Hallyu uh, movement, of the, of the wave, of the Korean wave, okay? Now, another factor for the popularization of K-pop, particularly from the 2010s onward, is YouTube. So just like size video that we just watched in the beginning of this talk, all the big K-pop bands, they released their new singles on YouTube and all the interaction with fans. As you know, K-pop has a very strong fan base. It all happens through YouTube in most cases. And then there are many reality shows, live broadcasting on YouTube. And as we just saw Ethereal, I, I think you guys did a great show. And groups like Ethereal and Wavy and others, they upload their dance videos to YouTube, right? And we basically have, um, in addition to the K-pop industry, we have adjacent K-pop industry, industries actually, and, and, and dance videos by fans, uploaded by fans, it's just another type of like adjacent K-pop industry that, um, that we see, okay? All right, now I'm getting to the final section of my um, brief um, comments about K-pop. What, what are traditional elements in K-pop, right? And let me just give you two like brief examples of, of what I mean by that and why this is important for us to study. Now, we're going to look at One Us's Lit, which was um, released in 2019. And I want you to take um, special attention to the visual, the oral and the textual connections to Korean traditions. And before we get to the video clip, let me just point out this this section here in this uh, screenshot from the video that seems to indicate some kind of a, um, a window or a door, right, with a kind of this lattice pattern. Now, if we look at two pieces, two beautiful pieces from the um, collection of the museum, we actually see a similar kind of lattice, lattice window in the back of one of these um, opera prints, right? So there's definitely this connection made to, to the past, to the Korean past. Now, what are these two woodblock prints? They were created by a Scottish woman, actually, Elizabeth Keith, who lived in Japan for a couple of years in the early, um, early 20th century. And she also visited Korea and, you know, she, she took note of what was going on around her. And then she translated that knowledge visually in, in, in woodblock printing and um, also studied Japanese with block printing, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a lot we could say about her actually. And on the left-hand side, you see a scholar, a Confucian scholar dressed in traditional um, government official like garb. And in the back, we have a landscape screen kind of framing the scene. And on the right-hand side, we have two um, people like male uh, um, individuals also sitting on the floor 
um, playing a game of chess, right? And again, this is framed in this kind of traditional um, architectural setting with the lattice window in the back. Now, I'm going to play the beginning of the video and I want you to keep in mind those different visual, oral and lyrics um, that are kind of related to traditional Korean culture. So in terms of visuals, um, observe what you see. Okay, so I want you to see, can you see the traditional palace architecture? Can you see the Buddhist temple painting, the Tanshong painting? That is, Tanshong means, um, is, is a reference to the type of decoration that was used to, um, that was used to decorate the, the upper part of, of Buddhist architecture, for example. So see if you can see that in the video, okay? And then the traditional costumes that the singers are, are wearing. And in terms of oral elements, listen very closely and, and check if you can identify string and wind instruments that seem to be not kind of Western, but more like traditional instruments. And then in terms of lyrics, actually, um, they are making a reference to Niliria, which is a traditional Korean folk song. And then there are also quite a few non-lexical syllables like olshigu, which means like right on or love it. So there are these kinds of syllables that are um, kind of interjections during a traditional Korean music performance like pansori or Korean traditional opera, where the audience says things like olshigu, jota or something to kind of encourage the singers, the performers. And so you will, if you listen very closely, you will hear those syllables during, during the performance. Okay, so let's listen in. Do you remember? <laughs> Do you remember looking at some of those elements that I just described? Did you recognize them during the video? You did? Okay, great. So, um, you know, there are different approaches that we can take towards analyzing these traditional elements, right? So let me be um, very critical about the ways how traditional elements are incorporated in this particular video um, it is kind of a fantasy pop styling of traditional culture, right? So the danchong, for instance, this type of danchong would be hung at the ceiling, but here we see it on the wall. The, um, the, the, what they're wearing is not really a hanbok, but it's kind of a fancy pop version of hanbok, perhaps, right? So. I think it's good that we see those traditional elements, but at the same time, we need to deep, we need to dig deeper if we really wanted to understand the type of aesthetics and, and traditions that were important in Korean culture and before the in like in pre-modern times. Okay. So let me show you um, a couple of seconds from um, another video, Dechita, that came out in 2020. Um, it's a suga of BTS. Um, and who produced and and created um, the song for this video. And this is kind of interesting too. So I would say it's a little bit of a better production 
because it's taking an actual sample. You will hear the actual sample of a marching song for kings and high-ranking officials from the Joseon period. And then it combines traditional musical instruments, the pipe, the drum, the gong. And if you look at the video background, um, it provides a fairly authentic, like pre-1900 market scene and the royal palace scene. Of course, you have the um, the rap, right, which is which is like Western style. But um, I would say this is maybe a, a more successful rendering of incorporating tradition into MVs. Okay, so let's listen in for a couple of seconds before wrapping up. <laughs> Okay, I think you know what I'm getting at, right? <laughs> okay, so let's move on to, uh, I think it's one of the last slides here, um, the Confucian mindset. Okay, I wanted to have a slide or two about that because whenever I, you know, I teach K-pop here at the University of Kansas and whenever I teach it, I get comments by students who say, oh yeah, it's all because um, the Koreans are such, you know, hardworking people and because they have a strong, like, Confucian mindset and, and, and so these K-pop bands, they work very hard and very, are very diligent and that's, that's all because of their Confucian background and that's why they're so successful and popular, right? <laughs> But um, I take issue with that kind of a statement. Okay, we have to dig a little bit deeper, um, be a little bit um, more concerned with um, how we use certain words. Okay, and Confucianism is a big word that can explain basically everything and nothing. <laughs> okay, so the question for you is now, you know, would you agree with that kind of statement or not? Okay. Well, let me give you some food for thought here. First of all, why are K-pop bands successful? Well, it has largely something to do with discipline, right? In order to become a musician, you, you know, it requires years and years of hard training, regardless of cultural background. So discipline has nothing to do with Confucianism per se, okay? And then when we look at, like, when we compare a Joseon period Confucian scholars' goals in life and, and, and a contemporary South Korean K-pop idol, and I'm giving you the South, the, the Korean, the Confucian scholar that we just saw in Elizabeth Keith's Whoopla print, and then on the other side, you see Suga of BTS. So if you compare these two, the purpose and the motives are actually very different. So a Joseon period scholar's goal, so Joseon means like, you know, a scholar who lived in 14th to 19th century Korea. Um, the ultimate goal was neo-Confucian self-cultivation. So you, will be, you wanted to become a well-rounded person that would serve the state and become a state official. The ultimate goal was to become a state official. And seeking fame was like something that they definitely did not want to have. In contrast, K-pop idols, you know, they um, they want to become famous, they want to be popular, and they want to, they have to actually create revenue for their companies. And another framework that we see with K-pop is that K-pop singers are in an exploitative process, right? They are objectified as commodities. They are only as like they are only valuable as long as they are young and beautiful. And once 
all those BTS members go into the military, we'll see what will happen to the band, right? Usually when a K-pop band is, has like male singers and they all have to go to the military, that's basically the end of the band, right? So very different goals, okay? But one thing they have in common, and that is very strong moral values, okay? So K-pop singers are very much expected to live the life of a, of a social role model. So my conclusive remarks, um, K-pop idols have to fulfill a social role model. They have to um, function as cultural ambassadors to South Korea. Um, K-pop is a style of training, um, of producing and performing popular music. It covers various music genres. I would say K-pop presents the best visuals and best dance performances since Michael Jackson. I mean, you just saw the beautiful group performing on stage and we also just watched many MVs. I mean, that K-pop really has perfect synchronization, right? And um, looking at this from like an, an outsider's perspective, I'm actually um, from, from Berlin, Germany, and I, you know, I'm looking at US pop music and Korean music from like, from a European's perspective, so to speak. So we, with K-pop success, we basically see a reversal of long established cultural flows from the West, particularly from the US to the rest of the world. And basically now it's reversed. Now it's K-pop, now it's Korea bringing music into the West, right? And um, there are many things that that we can contribute to k-pop and one of this of these trends is more and more people sign up for korean language classes and for classes at um, universities all around the world to learn more about korea and i think that's great i think the music videos that we saw that incorporated traditional values make people perhaps curious about korea's past and then they can you know take classes with me and with other scholars all around the world and learn more about korean culture and traditions and i hope that in the long run this will lead to a deeper understanding of korea in the west and that's it thank you so much for listening in and i look forward to more presentations and the discussions with a q a with you Thank you so much again for the invitation. Thank you so much, Maya, for that fascinating um, and visually and auditorily um, engaging presentation. That was really a lot of fun. Um, we are now going to uh, shift gears a little bit here, and we're going to um, have a truly uh, international conversation here. Um, we have two additional presenters who are going to um, come up on the stage in just a moment and um, join Maya in conversation about global connections to K-pop and the broader art world. So I'm going to introduce our two uh, St. Louis space speakers, and then they'll come up on the stage and um, have a conversation um, with Maya. So Hannah Clem is Associate Curator of Contemporary Art here at the St. Louis Art Museum. She curates the museum's Currents and New Media Series exhibitions. At SLAM, she's also co-curated the exhibitions Kehinda Wiley St. Louis, Oliver Lee Jackson, and Sun Shun Time Spy, among others. She holds a doctorate from the U University of Chicago, a master's degree from the Courtauld Institute of Art, and a bachelor's degree in art history from Sarah Lawrence College. Mijay is a multidisciplinary Indian artist mother whose sensibilities are shaped by the mythologies and folklore of India, historical accounts of the past, archeological remains of ancient India, and her travels the length and breadth of the Indian subcontinent. She has an MFA from the Sam Fox School at Washington University in St. Louis, a master's degree in history from Jarwahal Nehru University, and an MPhil in liberal arts from Am Ambedekar University in Delhi. She is the recipient of McDonnell International Scholarship and USA States Fellowship LFP. Mee's works have been exhibited in India and here in St. Louis. Please join me in welcoming Hannah and me to join Maya in conversation. I'm gonna give a very, uh, it's like a bird's view of the Indian uh, pop music in very contrast to what Korea is, a very tiny country 
very controlled, disciplined, nationally controlled. India is the exact opposite. Small things that I can tell about is, we have 22 languages. I need to say this before I go ahead of it. We have 28 states, and each different part of North, West, South, and East, they have very different cultures, languages, food, uh, traditional uh, rituals, and everything. Now imagine if we have pop culture, how different would it be? I won't discuss all of them, that won't be possible, but we'll just give you a very short history of Indian pop music, and then go on how, uh, Namaya discussed how Korean is pop culture, and I'll say how Indian is Indian pop culture. India has been very interesting in the sense that it has always been very inviting to all kinds of foreign elements. And we accept it as ours, then you won't be able to make a difference how non-Indian that element has been. So, Bollywood is the boss. In India, Bollywood produces and consumes the largest number of music created. We have movies that have like five, six songs, and it could be half the movie is song and half the movie is the rest of it. But we also have albums. We also have live performances. We also have groups that perform at multiple places where there could be dance performance, there could be just a singing performance, and we have this very old culture of performing by saints, by bowl singers, by uh, artists. So in the Squid Game, which is very popular in India, Korean TV serials, Korean movies, Korean hairstyles, Korean fashions, it's just so popular just with the K-pop. My husband has a K-pop glasses. So, I mean, I don't think I am so far away from K-pop culture, but, the influence of MTV in the 90s brought in the most of the international uh, pop music and pop culture in India. Before that, it was more of an India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh. So we had all these South Asian countries continuously, historically as well as in the present time. We have been exchanging knowledge of all kinds, cultural, historic, material, trades, all of it. Multilingual nature of Indian music has been always there. Just as I said, we have 22 languages, but we always keep bringing in like Hindi, Urdu, or Hindi, Punjabi, English. So all those things, English comes a little later in Indian pop music. So I think, uh, and yes, prominent in regional languages, there are too many of them, so I'll just discuss three or four. In the nine, early 1980s, the three major singers and performers came very popular in India and all three of them were from Pakistan. India and Pakistan might, might ter, come across as enemies, but they are not. They are, they are technically twin uh, nations and culturally, historically, they have been together all this while. So Ataullah Khan uh, was actually a Qawwali singer, which is kind of a religious singer, very traditional, but he was, he was a rage in India. And interestingly, Pakistani singers became very famous in India, and Indian singers were equally famous in Pakistan. We like not to respect our own singers so much. We like the foreign elements, just as I said. The Euphoria band by Palash Sen, Indian Oceans, these were very famous. They came famous in 90s, and they go on till 2000 uh, thing. In 2010, we got the Coke Studio. I must, I don't know, I got, I, I'm not sure if you are aware about the Coke Studio. So it's a kind of a music studio that brings in all kinds of folk songs and makes it very contemporary, very classy. Uh, from classic to classy, they make it, you know, just create fusions with new instruments, uh, young singers or maybe the uh, contemporary pop singers, along with folk singers. I'll play a f one slide. Okay, be ready for the Indian music. Hey, 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 hey,
This is actually a band that was very active in 1990s, but they continue to perform all over the world. And this is from the US from 2018. So they keep improvising on their performance, on their instrumental uh, aspect of the uh, pop music. In 2010 came a major flux which had two major strands. One was show of power, uh, which also in, which also brought in a lot of anti-social elements like alcohol, like abusive language, misogynistic, uh, you know, lyrics and songs. It was, I mean, a person like me who is who prefers a very disciplined and a, you know, not so happening sort of life. It was something that I did not like, and. Only for this thing, I went through so many of those songs and I realized some of them were so bad as that I cannot play them here. Seriously, I am not kidding. So it, it's a good contrast to understand pop music in Korea and in here. We have no national censorship in India. People, I don't know why, love all kinds of weird and strange lyrics. I'm calling them strange. But also came caste-based songs. So in India, you have to understand there is caste, which is social structure. Then there is class, which is economic structure. Then there is regionalism based on the language spoken and the state they belong to. It's a bit complicated, but all these factors play in, in the cultural, uh, in the pop culture and music. Some of the songs started coming in in 2010. I'll just discuss the first one and then go to the multilingualism. So some of the songs that came in started challenging the traditional or the classical social order. So the people and singers or basically those who had money started talking about how powerful and how influential or perhaps how important their caste is for the uh, society. More so saying, asserting their identity as we are this and we are powerful, we have money. I will just show you a little bit of this video and you will have an idea that unlike what Maya presented about Korean uh, K-pop, where discipline is important and you have to be the social idol, it's the exact opposite. that's all I can take. <laughs> there are other versions where they are literally talking about how the low caste people who are basically uh, leather workers or metal smiths or those who deal with the dead animals are so so socially lower ladder of people, how they are studying, they are earning money, they are working in United States or Canada and getting a lot of foreign money so they are rich and they are asserting their social presence in the, uh, in the classic social order of Indian society. Those are interesting things. And I think it, it's a very interesting move, the way social order is being challenged and people are being reordered, or rather communities are being reordered based on their academic and uh, economic empowerment. The other move was the multilingualism. India, Indian states, they are generally together. So to understand each other's language is easy, but 
by 2010, there was a new wave of bringing in English. And very funny, funny way, they bring in English uh, into their language. So there could be Tamil with English, Bangla with English, uh, Hindi with English, of course, that was very common in Bollywood since very beginning. But there were also like Bhojpuri in English. So we have, uh, I'm just, I will be discussing and showing mostly from Hindi, English, uh, I think I took out some of those. But this is a Bengali song, very traditional folk Bengali song that they brought in in a very contemporized manner. And you will see how they are using folk lyrics, Indian dance moves with Westo, Indo Western sort of visuals. <laughs> So in this video, you just saw there, they use three different languages, Bangla, which is a regional language, English and Hindi. This is the one way they have been bringing in a lot of contemporary uh, visuals, lyrics, uh, dancing styles, instrumental music, and all kinds of things. So these are kind of pop singers who do not work for uh, the Bollywood industry, but they primarily have their own albums, they do singles, this, and YouTube has been a big, big hit. The very latest trend that we see now is whatever makes wave on internet gets, in, gets encashed in the music industry, the pop music industry. I have the best example here. I wanna show you two, so, the first lady, the lady singer, she's from Sri Lanka. She started singing a song which became a big hit on uh, YouTube or all over the social media on TikTok and all over the places. She got to pair with, I mean, she was invited to pair with different la language singers. She sang with English and Tamil and Hindi and all kinds of singers. That is just how they could encash on something that was actually already popular. The, the one, this kid here, uh, the, the lower bottom, this kid was actually kind of bullied but kind of forced into singing a song and he lisps. So instead of saying, Bachpan ka pyar, which means a childhood love, he said, Baspan ka pyar. And that became such a viral on TikTok and Instagram that they, they actually made a video uh, with this child. I'm sure the child did not benefit any bit from this. But the very interesting thing I want to show you uh, right here. I can't ask all of you what you think of this video, but just listen to this video and then I'll show you another video right after this.
I, I, sorry, I'm laughing because this is the most hilarious combination I'm going to show you. But you might have already heard these songs because it was a rage on TikTok. So many of Bollywood singers were actually dancing on this, not knowing what the song means. Now I show you the real video of the real singer of this song. <laughs> So you understand how anything that gets popular gets encashed in the pop music industry of India. The most sad part of the whole thing was this guy still lives in a, perhaps still lives in a unthatched mud roof house, mud house, mud brick house, whatever, no, not brick house, sorry, mud walled house. He did not benefit any bit from this whole music video that, you know, got the singer so many million viewership and whatever revenue. He had to go to the police, the district police, to ask for any kind of help. That, okay, I have become a national icon, international, because this song was performed, like became a big rage in, even in African countries all over the world. People have no idea what the song means. This poor guy is a hawker, he's selling peanuts, peanuts, and he's asking for anything broken and discarded, technical, technological things that you have, a broken, phone, a bangle, or an ankle, it, anything that you have of any kind of metal, give it to me and I'll give you unroasted peanuts. So kacha badam is unroasted peanuts and he's saying, I don't have roasted peanuts, I can just give you this. So this is the, I, I know, I know this is not just hilarious, this is ridiculous and it's almost like a sarcastic comment on the way uh, any kind of creativity gets encashed into a system and the original person doesn't even get the credit or any kind of benefit out of it. So I think it's a point where I can move a little bit to say uh, Indian music is like a salad bowl, literally. It's a, it brings in all the folk songs, all kinds of visuals from Western, Middle Eastern, Asian countries. Instrumental music, literally from across the world, they utilize all those instrumental musics, they bring in choreography. Again, a, a belly dancing is very common in Indian pop music. Dressings, Western definitely, but also now Indian music, uh, Indian dresses are becoming more popular. And singing styles, hip hop, rock. I mean, they, they bring in even, uh, maybe, hold on, I wanna go back a little bit. There was a slide where there are some of the uh, singers in Maharashtra, which is the South India, where they got inspired by Dr. Dre's lyrics and they started a whole slum, uh, slum life and they started doing musical hip hops about the Indian slum life. But that's, what, that was, that's more inspirational than annoying. Nope, nope, okay. And here I take the privilege of introducing how I connect with connected with pop, pop music when I was going through this whole research that my practice as a multidisciplinary artist is pretty much on the same note of the Indian uh, culture of bringing, taking in different elements from all over the world. I work with American material but use visual lexicons from India and the crafts that I have learned over years. But these crafts, craft techniques that I work with are not only Indian, they, they are pretty much from all across the world that I like and I can use it in my uh, art pieces. This is one of the examples that I, this was actually the first installation I did in America because I had no money and I couldn't buy anything. So all the fabric you see here has been given by the American uh, and immigrant communities in the United, in the St. Louis. And the woods are basically found material that I cut into shapes that I liked. 
And I feel that Indian culture has been pretty much like this, taking in everything that they considered important to their cultural knowledge, they brought in that without uh, any hesitation of what is not Indian. And they just made them uh, theirs. This is one another piece where it, these are actually bundles. I started bundling when COVID hit in 2020. And I, at, I had a two, I mean, my son is now four, but back then he was just two years old and I thought I'm gonna die. If I die, of course, if I, I get COVID, my husband gets COVID, we both are dying and our older parents are gonna die in India. My son would have nobody to know who he is. And I started almost as a panic, uh, the way to just deal with my anxieties and my panic uh, moment. I started bundling his toys and shoes and socks and everything that I had of him when he was teeny mini. And it became almost like a therapeutic process where I started bundling, but bundling as an act of preserving my own memories, not just of me being a mother or a parent, but also as somebody who has a history of knowledge, a history of experiences and a cultural knowledge. I started bundling in different, different techniques that I knew and I learned so that when my son grows and if we are dead, uh, which we are not yet, thank God, and if he grows up, he can un I mean, unbundle them and realize that, oh, my mother knew this as well, this technique, this material, she was familiar with this thing and she preserved my memories, so how much she loved me. But again, all the material that you see here is from America. It's my sentiment, so in a way, my lyrics, my technique of presenting it, but everything is, the rest, all the material is from America. And I think it's a good point to end here my talk about the whole evening, my, my presentations. Thank you very much for listening to my talk. So moving to continue in thinking about global contemporary art, and it's so wonderful to see your work in these contexts. I was interested in some of the broader themes that Maya and Mijay brought up in terms of global pop music, but K-pop in particular. And one of the things that's so interesting is the way in which so many references are embedded within K-pop videos and the songs, and it weaves together this kind of global collage of references that is intended to be read by the fans. And I want to show you a selection of objects from the St. Louis Art Museum collection, many of which are on view, that hopefully you can take some of your knowledge of how you read a K-pop video or pop music and look at art in a similar way to see how contemporary artists are also kind of weaving in all these references and creating systems for you to really be able to use your ability to read all pop culture as a roadmap to really understanding and appreciating contemporary art in a global sense. Um, one of the main things we've been talking about, another kind of one of these uh, big theory words that holds a lot of meaning and no meaning at once, is uh, thinking about intertextuality. So very much these interconnected references. And one of the things that K-pop does is really weave together so many global references in the music. So I think one of the things we all have been noting is really the system of musical references and the global impact of many of these elements, especially African-American cultural production such as R&B and hip hop, has been incredibly interwoven into, now we see Indian popular music and into, into K-pop. So really being able to reference all of these different moments. And going back in time a little, we have this really amazing collage from the 60s in which the African-American artist Romare Bearden really does this on a beautiful scale. You see the intertextuality in the title, Summertime, which is referencing Cole Porter's lyrics, uh, Summertime and the Living is Easy, and also this kind of moment of thinking about the global, the local, and you have the scene of scene in Harlem, and this would be something that was really visible and was an impression of a specific African-American community, but also speaks to the history of art and collage and really building in these references for people to think about identity differently and also think about art differently. And here he's taken art historical reproductions as well as images from popular magazines. So again, building in these different reference points, the way that Maya was referencing historic Korean art within a very contemporary setting, really thinking about the way that references build on each other and help us really learn how to see the world and see ourselves within a global context. Another thing that I think has come up a lot that is incredibly important with 
popular music in general and especially global popular music and I found so interesting about K-pop was this, the issue and referencing of language. And I think it's amazing that K-pop's actually driving more people to learn Korean, but there's also something interesting about the ability for people to truly appreciate uh, K-pop who don't know Korean. That's really showcases the power of language and music in and of itself. And this amazing painting, which is on view in the galleries by Glenn Glygon, is really referencing the power of language, but also the ways in which language is in essence a form of abstraction. And here he's taken a sentence from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, another sense of this intertextuality, and repeated it by drawing it with oil stick through stencils. And as he repeated the painting of the words, it became more and more obscured. And the statement is the creature that Frankenstein created, lamenting his inability to express himself. So again, really thinking about these layers of articulation and how language becomes something that both is a way of expressing ourselves, but also can be a form of abstraction or erasure. Another work that's on view that I think really embodies many of these kind of global elements and this interest in technology and the movement of information and the sort of neoliberal culture that is so present in K-pop and in pop music and how information is disseminated is this amazing piece by Ethiopian artist Elias Sime. And again, deeply connecting the local to the global. Elias takes all of his materials from the Mercado, which is a famous open air market in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And he finds these abandoned pieces of technology that have been, or are, are not used anymore, mostly out of date, mostly things that people are kind of trying to take pieces of to reuse in new, new ways. And he constructs all of these motherboards and keyboards and phone parts to create this assemblage that not only mimics the history of Western landscape art, um, but also African textile making and thinking about things like surveillance, how we see the world from an airplane. It has this kind of Google Maps bird's eye view. So he's taking an incredibly local moment in Africa with the, Mer the, the Mercado market and then turning it into this very intertextual referential piece about the globalized world and technological movements. This piece is not currently on view, but is an amazing work um, in our collection. You can see it online, and it, there's always a reason to come to the museum because many of these works come back on view in different moments. But this is a piece by the American artist Cindy Sherman, who's known for her own, using herself and self-portraits of, her, of herself as her medium. So here, she's actually partnered with Sev, the famous uh, French porcelain maker, and they've reconstructed a really famous serving dish but if it's hard, it might be hard to see on this, but the central picture is actually an image created by Cindy Sherman in which she is recreating Madame Pompadour who was the French um, aristocrat who has actually uh, saved Sev from bankruptcy. So thinking about all of these layers, and I think that's one of the things that's so interesting in a K-pop video is you get many, many historical references. You get references to the Renaissance, to medieval imagery, to Korean imagery, to all of these moments. And here again, contemporary artists kind of taking the history of design, of decorative arts, and then imbuing her own contemporary practice within the actual fabric of this work, creating this moment of the contemporary within the historic. This piece, I think really, I don't know, the energy of it embodies the energy I see in a lot of what K-pop is trying to do. This is a work by the Ethiopian American artist, Julie Meritu. And this work really is kind of a visualization of neoliberalism, of the movement of information, of the economy, of the globalized universe that we live in. She's taken layers of acrylic, of paint and drawings and embedded many, many little references to everything from the, there's an Olympic symbol from the Russian Olympics to logos and architectural drawings within this absolute whirlwind of visual stimuli and color. And it becomes this kind of ability in which we move through space and time so quickly with all of our technological devices, but also how it almost becomes incoherent in that sense and that lack of being able to find your central reference point. And I think there's something also about the way that 
Instagram and TikTok that we talk about, these, these references become so layered, like your wonderful story about the Indian pop music of something like the problematics of being able to film somebody on the street and take it out of context and move it through these systems of pop culture. Julie Maritou is really thinking about the social and cultural and political implications of a lot of this um, movement of information. And this is a work by a Korean American artist, Cheo and Kim, and it's not on view right now, but it's a beautiful piece and I thought when I was watching a lot of K-pop videos, and we saw it in one of the videos you showed, Maya, too, there's this um, element of abstraction that's utilized in a lot of backgrounds that's kind of regimented and geometric. And it was interesting, because I was looking at Kim's work and reading about her as an artist, and she actually views the geometry and abstraction that she uses as references of the human condition. And she sees the different horizontal and vertical lines is actually symbolizing elements of our daily experience. So really thinking about how abstraction and geometry reference existences in the world. And for her, the horizontal lines signify kind of the passive, while the vertical lines signify the active. And so she's constructing a space in which passive and active are finding balance here. And so I think it's interesting to think about art who can take how we live in the world, but also turn it into something as abstract as this, but the process and thinking through it, we can really start to see ourselves in, in the works. The other element I think is really important, and I, I'm excited to get to open it up to conversation too, is this element of cultural citation, which is incredibly common in contemporary art as well. And it's exactly what both of our wonderful speakers have been talking about, is taking elements of hip hop, taking elements of R&B, taking elements of punk and rock, kind of weaving them together, but giving credit to those moments and to citing those. I think Meyer, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but there was a moment at the American Music Awards when Gangnam Style was really popular where he brought on MC Hammer and it was a little literal reference to one of his inspirations. So thinking about these actual references as also being citations, as drawing attention to those who came before, who you've trained with, I know BTS, trained with several American hip hop artists in the US. And so just thinking about it as a system of citation. Um, this is an American, a Japanese American artist, uh, Gajin Fujita. And this is an amazing work because he's actually interested in exploring the relationship of the Asian American communities in LA to the hip hop scene. And he's from Boyle Heights, which is a predominantly Latin American neighborhood, but it's adjacent to Little Tokyo and only about 15 minutes from Koreatown. So exploring those kind of neighborhood adjacencies. And what he does is he actually has his friends, other graffiti writers and hip hop um, aficionados, they tag the painting with their street tags. And then he goes in over them and paints these uh, traditional Japanese scenes predominantly of samurai culture, but then embeds LA and hip hop uh, logos into it. So you can see the LA Dodgers, there's a Louis Vuitton kind of uh, scene in there too. So thinking about these kind of really creating citations and of reference in these kind of global trends and thinking about how something like hip hop has had such global influence. Um, Another video that, I, this is an amazing video I came across recently. It's actually on view in Chicago right now at the Renaissance Society. But I think this really shows the impact of K-pop on contemporary art. This is Diane Severin Young, who is a American artist from California of Vietnamese descent. But she is a big K-pop fan and is really interested in the way that K-pop has um, become so influential all around the world. So she started doing research and found that Polish, there's a huge K-pop following in Poland. So she went and created this film, which is um, constructed, but it's based on the reality of how interested uh, Polish people are in K-pop, where she created a orphaned Vietnamese character who's the central figure in this, who the film is about her organizing a Polish K-pop group in Poland, and then they perform at these former Eastern, like former communist monuments. So kind of constructing this relationship between East and West, communism and capitalism, and really constructing it around the fact that K-pop is a phenomenon that exists everywhere, but has different tenors that connect to different local conditions. And so, 
yeah, it's really a wonderful film. Hopefully we can, it's hard to get art films to show. I'm sorry about that. You have to get a lot of rights, but uh, it's worth looking out for it. And, and I think that it's just another indication that K-pop and contemporary art are deeply intertwined. And finally, I think that there's a really interesting and important element of the performance of identity, but also of values. As Maya said, there's a lot of um, representation of political values, of social values. You know, there's been interest in climate change, in thinking about um, LGBTQ rights within K-pop, and contemporary art also has a lot of thinking about how contemporary art can actually create these bridges in terms of thinking about identity and values. In 2018, we had the privilege of having Kahinda Wiley come to St. Louis and have a show, Kahinda Wiley St. Louis, you, many of you may have seen that, and we acquired this work, um, Charles I by Kahinda Wiley, which was actually based on a painting in our collection called Charles I, and Kahinda does this kind of performance of values by replacing historic figures in traditional art historical portraiture with, um, with black individuals that are cast primarily from the location. So this is actually a picture of local St. Louis and Ashley Cooper was represented in our portrait, but this kind of juxtaposition and kind of reappropriation of power and giving power to people who hadn't been traditionally represented in the art historical canon. And I couldn't help with all of the art historical research to not mention the video Blood, Sweat and Tears by BTS because Again, this becomes this moment of intertextuality, of cultural citation, and uses the Belgian Royal Museum and Peter Bruegel to become this like absolutely Baroque rendition of, I think, everything we've been talking about, and also just that literal citation of art and the art holding kind of a key to understanding the meaning of the video. Maya, do you, is there anything that you wanna jump in on? Because we've been, talking at your screen for a while. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed uh, both presentations quite a lot. Um, one thing that Mijay was mentioning at the end with her beautiful um, artwork, and I was thinking of the traditional Korean wrapping, um, the bojagi. Um, so in, in Korea, we have this kind of um, quadrangularly shaped wrapping cloth that people would use for like traditional gifts for like a wedding ceremony or something. Or also, you know, I, I remember my mom also using a wrapping cloth to wrap my lunch. <laughs> so my mother is Korean. So um, yeah, so, so we have this tradition in Korea that, that you might want to look into for further inspiration. And there are Korean contemporary artists who have also used a kind of bojagi wrapping technique in their artworks as well. So um, yeah, that was that was fascinating. And of course, intertextuality. I mean, that's very, very common. Um, I mean, there are there is I use videos that have references to Alice in Wonderland, and and so definitely there are many references, and they are incorporated into K-pop also for the fans. It's kind of a treasure hunt for the fans to look for those cult um, references, not only between East and West, but also. Um, they see references to earlier uh, songs by the band um, in newer videos, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, yeah, it's lots of lots of fun stuff. So, thank you both for for great uh, presentations. I learned a lot. Thank you. So we are running uh, short on time. I want to thank all three of our presenters who are um, here with us in person on the stage, Hannah and me, and uh, Maya, who um, is joining us um, across, the, across the miles. Um, this was fascinating. I mean, I think obviously there's a lot to dig into here. We could have a lot more conversation on this topic and maybe we'll pick it up in another future program at some point. But this you know, globalization and interconnectedness and, and um, all these ideas that we're talking about I think are really fascinating and rich and you know, K-pop was just a jumping off point for what has you know, really led us to a lot of different topics and conversations. So um, we are gonna draw our program this evening um, to a close um, and I wanna just thank all of our presenters and performers um, who are with us this evening. And before I turn it over to um, Sung Kwan who's gonna give us some closing remarks, I wanna be sure to give a real shout out to 
to our SLAM AV team. Um, Ken and Nathan, who have been in the booth, there have been a lot of moving parts tonight. We've had you know, um, presenters beaming in from all over and um, on stage performances. So let's give our AV team a big round of applause. I think we've used all the equipment available to us <laughs> this evening, so um, so thanks to them, it's been it's been a seamless event. Um, and so um, with that, then I'm going to um, we have also join, joining us live from Zoom um, uh, via Zoom from Kanju National University is uh, to bring the closing remarks to this year's um, Dano celebration is Gateway Korea Foundation um, Board Chair Dr. Sung Gwan Yu. Sung Gwan, um, please uh, close us out for this evening. My name is Sung Won Yu, uh, Chair of uh, DKF Board of Directors. Uh, first of all, thank you Maya, Hannah, uh, and DJ for the wonderful presentation uh, and discussion. Uh, we learned a lot tonight. Uh, it is very timely, uh, insightful, and eye-opening session for all of us. Uh, this is my special privilege to join Dano Festival from Korea at Gongju uh, uh, National University Overseas uh, Korea Education Center with faculty, students, and especially uh, overseas uh, Koreans from all over the world to study Korean uh, language, culture, and history at Gongju National University. Uh, they have uh, 21 uh, students from Japan, Kazakhstan, uh, Uzbekistan, uh, Iran, and, and more. I'm sure the K-pop is uh, one of their uh, motivation to come to join this program. Uh, they have a two-month program at uh, Gongju National University, and they offer a scholarship, and so I strongly encourage you to join uh, this program. I give special thanks to uh, uh, Gongju National University President uh, Song Soo Won and the Director Professor Eun Jung Lee to make our first joint effort uh, in this Tano Festival. Gongju National University is a uh, uh, GKF first partner university in Korea, which is located in Gongju, uh, which was the ancient uh, capital at Baekje Kingdom, which lasted from uh, 1st BC to 7th uh, century. It's known for the rich cultural and historical sites. Uh, these days, uh, many Koreans are wondering why K-pop and K-culture is so popular around the world. As you, you might have heard, Korea film uh, maker Park Chan-wook and uh, movie star Song Kang-ho received the awards at the Cannes uh, Film Festival recently. And BTS was especially invited by President Biden at the White House and presented about AAPI and diversity issues. And tonight we got some answers how Korea is K-pop, and but also how global is K-pop. And Korea culture is very warm and family friendly and respecting uh, others. Uh, Korea culture, uh, K-culture is now premier at the world stage. Uh, many young Korean artists and musicians, both uh, pop and traditional music, often collaboration between these two, uh, play around the world. Hope we can have an uh, opportunity to see this uh, Korean uh, performance in person in St. Louis at GKF event, most likely next year to celebrate GKF 10th uh, anniversary. Thank you very much uh, for joining tonight's Tunnel Festival and special thanks to St. Louis Art Museum to provide such a wonderful venue. Again, good night and have a safe trip back home. Thank you.